Kinmount Baptist Church in the wonderful community of Kinmount, Ontario, Canada. Well, it's been quite a week. Last Sunday was the day after the invasion by Hamas on Israel. So we're what? This is the ninth day. I get confused because their time and our time is a lot different. And it's fascinating to me as we pray for Israel, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the Lord every day, especially when they're in distress like this. So this week, I've had several of you and others uh, asking me, I thought I'd address it just before we go to our scripture reading this morning. Well, Bruce, is this that Ezekiel 38, 39 war that you've prophesied about? I haven't prophesied. I've taught you the prophecy of that. Is this the Psalm 83 war? I think last week I mentioned to you that keep your eye on Turkey. Keep your eye on Damascus. Two summers ago, as we've taught you, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, for the first time in history, did you hear that? For the first time in history, they collaborated. They signed a covenant together that they would protect each other in the time of war. So last week at this time, I hadn't heard anything about Turkey. We'd heard from Russia. We'd heard from, from Iran, of course. And it's fascinating what's coming out of that. When I got home that night and got up the next morning, I'd heard from Turkey. I've heard about Turkey. You're going to hear a lot of untruth. I would say shut off CBC, shut off CTV, shut off the global, and for sure shut off CP24. That's my opinion. You're allowed to watch it. But I would say shut it off. The only truth that's actually coming out, I believe, is coming out of Israel. So tune in to the folks that are on site in Israel speaking truth. And if you can get Christian ones, that's even better. No, this is not the Ezekiel 38, 39 war. And if you recall, see how good your teacher was, that begins probably around the midpoint of the tribulation period. And it ends with the Battle of Armageddon. No, it's not the Psalm 83 war. Now, some guys believe it could be. I don't. And the reason I don't is because Psalm 83 says all the enemies of God will be whipped. They'll be wiped right out. That's not happening. That's not going to happen now. It's going to happen at the end of the 38, 39 Ezekiel war. Okay. I don't want to preach on this today. I am not going to describe the wickedness that happened last week. I'm sure some of you saw it. Many of you have heard about it. I'm not going to get into it. But I will say this. If you go back to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, just before the flood. It's a passage of scripture that I have pondered for years. How could this be? How could this be? The wickedness that was going on in the world. And that word wickedness, is it's beyond the pale wicked. It's not, I've got a wicked son, wicked. It's beyond the pale. And it's fascinating to me that he says, the wickedness was so bad that every thought was wicked. And now the experts have told me, told us over the years, these last few years, there was probably between 7 and 8 billion people on earth back then. I used to think there was probably a few hundred thousand maybe. They figure about the same as today. Isn't that amazing? because of the length they lived and how many kids they had, and it just multiplied and all. Same thing's going to happen in the millennium. 
How many got saved? Eight. God protected Noah and his family. That was it. The wrath of God wiped out the rest of civilization. The other thing that's very interesting to me, and I'll end with this before we get into our uh, study this morning. That word for wicked in the translation is Hamas. Now, isn't that interesting? And it's found over 57 times in the scriptures. I find that interesting. Don't read into it, but isn't it interesting how relevant this book we call the Bible is? We're to be the light, spreading the news, the good news. We're to be the salt. Say no when it's untruth. Don't hide in the corner. We've done that too long. Say no, that's not right. Study your Bible. Ladies, you're going to be in a wonderful study with end times discernment. Discernment's a wonderful word. You already know what's right and wrong. Discernment is determining what's best on the right side. I hope that's what your definition is when you give it. Mike. And so I just plead with you plead with you to be the salt not just the light you got to be the light you got to be the light be the salt too the other thing that really troubles me and I don't like criticizing other pastors other than when they deserve it (laughs) Uh, let me rephrase that there's a lot of pastors out there people Christians out there Prosperity preaching. I don't know if you've heard the term. You know, do this and God's going to give you everything. Well, first of all, I don't agree with that, but that's another story. But a lot of them are now saying, look, at, just hang in there. Don't take sides. And everything's going to be okay. What's the term? It's going to be better. It's going to be better. Well, it is going to be better. But it ain't going to be better now. It's going to be better in the millennium. It's not going to be better now. And so if you come across a Christian that says, just relax, don't do anything, don't take sides, it's, it's okay, everything is going to get better. Well, they're not thinking better in the millennium, they're thinking better now. And so we'll just sit this out. In the last three generations since the war, I've tried to sit it out. So as your pastor, I'm just saying, Be careful. Be careful. And be praying for our folks. Be praying for our folks. And we as a local body of believers, we've got to be the light here. But we also have to be the salt. Last week we began back in Luke's Gospel. After a, well I guess it was middle of June, we started the Prophecy (laughs) mini-series. We see in chapter 22, we started with chapter 22 last week, that Jesus came to this earth to die. You know that. He lived every day anticipating his death. And he knew perfectly well what the plan was. He knew where it was going to happen, by whom it was going to happen, when it was going to happen. He knew all that stuff ahead of time. We also know that when we study this, we we meet some characters, and they're very compelling. And we could spend a Sunday, every Sunday, for the next couple or three months on these individuals that were part of the crucifixion of our Lord. Satan himself, Judas, Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, Herod, the disciples. They all played a part, and they're all very compelling individuals from the scripture but all of them fade fade is a good word under the blazing light of our Lord Jesus Christ I hope you love him I hope you love him we see Jesus here humiliated but we also see his majestic side we see him suffering a lot And yet we'll see him exalted. We'll see him punished. But we know he's innocent. 
And so did they. We see the hatred. And that hatred's continued right through today in the Mideast. The hatred of Christ and any Christ followers. But we see His love. And we see Him subjected to this. But He is sovereign. He is God. He's sovereign. Jesus will move through the events that are going to happen in these next few verses with being in the divine will, the divine power, the divine schedule. Everything will be exactly like it was planned out. And when did that plan happen? The Bible's very clear. Before the foundation of the world. And I think we alluded to that last week. He willingly heads to the cross to die as the Father's chosen sacrificial lamb. So what? Well, the so what is he bore the whole world's sin from the beginning to the end on himself. He took on the wrath of his Father for Bruce Mason, for the whole world so that we could have an everlasting relationship with him. But there's one thing I think I tried to make it clear last week, and if not, then this week. Remember this. He is not a victim. He's not a victim. Not at all. The divine plan before the foundation of the world, where he was first identified as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That was all done before. The world was formed. So there's only a couple of days he's going to be dead here. He's going to die in a couple of days. He's meeting with his apostles. And it's a, it's a wonderful day. There's a whole bunch of things that happened during this time. And we're going to talk about a little bit about that today. But what's going to happen mainly, and this is what I, my main point today is, he is going to end something but then he's going to begin something. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22. We're going to read a few verses beginning at verse 14. This is a very familiar passage if you've been with us at all. Communion Sundays, I usually choose from three or four passages in the New Testament, and I love the Luke passage, and we read this one. And you should have this one memorized, but I'm going to read it to you. Uh, verse 14 says this. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it amongst yourself. For I say to you, I won't drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. And of course, we know that's the millennium. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Brief moment of prayer. Father, guide and direct us now as we open this precious word and study a bit from it. May we learn some truth and apply it. For your kingdom's sake. Amen. This is a turning point in redemptive history. A turning point in redemptive history. The last official Passover and the first communion. The last official Passover and the first communion. This is an end to the Old Covenant. This is the beginning of the New Covenant. And it begins a new memorial. And this memorial, as we do once a month, and there's nothing in the Scripture that tells us we have to do it once a month, the connotation is that we do it regularly and we've just picked once a month so we didn't forget. Probably. In that memorial, we look back at the cross. We look back at what Jesus has done, the fact that he died and was buried and was risen again. 
for you and for me. No longer the old covenant. The Passover. It's a remember, it's a memorial as well. It, it looks back to the Passover. When the angel of death passed over any door in Egypt that the post and the lintel had covered in blood. And if you didn't have that, you would lose your firstborn. The angel of death would kill your firstborn. And so that's a big deal to the Jewish nation. That was what they looked back to. And unfortunately, that's what they still look back to. Bruce, you're getting nasty. No, I'm not. No. We have a new memorial. We look back at the cross. Back at the cross. A wonderful deliverance. In Egypt, they say there was between two and a half and three and a half million people delivered out of Egypt by God. A couple of principles as you study this. Two. Two principles that I could say are key principles. That deliverance from God's judgment requires death. You got that? Deliverance from God's judgment requires death. And the second principle, death can be the death of a substitute. And we see that all the way through the Old Testament. Right up to the cross. No animal was satisfactory to take away your sins. The only satisfactory sacrifice came when God offered God as the sacrifice. That substitute for Bruce Mason, for all of us. And when did it happen? This, this innocent, perfect sacrifice that happened at Calvary. And the fascinating thing is we know exactly when it happened, time-wise, between 3 and 6 in the afternoon. Why was that important? That's when the sacrificial lambs were, were sacrificed in Jerusalem between 3 and 6 in the afternoon. Thousands of them. Jesus was sacrificed during that time. Amazing. And this became the last Passover, this Passover that he has with his apostles, with his disciples. No more animal sacrifices needed. No more, no more. And all those animal sacrifices, if you pay attention to the Old Testament scriptures, they were, all, they were looking forward to the Messiah coming. And those who actually got into the scriptures found out that the Messiah had to suffer and die for the sins of the unrighteous, and that would give them righteousness. The animals were only a symbol. This reading, this time, this night, much had to be accomplished that night. And the fascinating thing to me as I studied this weeks ago, Jesus controls it all. It's controlled. It's not haphazard like as in our house when we're eating. This is all controlled. And it's interesting also that if you think about it, Passover was instituted by God. So it's got to be eliminated by God. And who's God on this earth? Jesus of Nazareth. Fascinating that night. If you go to John's account of this time, read chapter 13 through 16 and what Jesus instructs the disciples and the apostles to do. It's a great study from 13 to 16. Then you get to chapter 17 and that monumental prayer of Jesus to his father about the believers, about specifically the disciples. What a wonderful prayer. We could spend four, five, six weeks on that chapter easily. Wonderful prayer. That was that night. What else happened that night? Well, he exposes and dismisses Judas Iscariot. He confronts with Peter. Because <laughs> it's a great story. I'm going I'm to preach on it, I think, in a couple of weeks. He confronts with Peter about allowing Satan to sift Peter. That was that night. And there's an argument. There's an argument amongst the disciples. I'm the greatest. Lord, who's going to be the greatest in heaven? That was that night. 
Now, that's a great story. True story. Anybody remember Muhammad Ali? Cassius Clay? I am the greatest. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. And, of course, later, he goes to the garden to be arrested that night. If you look at all four Gospels, they all talk about this. Now, it's fascinating to me, and a lot of things are fascinating to me. If you really get a study on it, and you're comparing apples and apples, and you're hoping they're apples and apples, the four Gospels, they speak, it, all four speak of these things. But if you just speak about the things, you might get mixed up a little bit on the timing of it. I would say this, look at it as a whole that night, as a whole. It's one event. It, it lasted for hours. And all the components of this are, are critical, but the timing isn't. The timing is not critical in this for us. So take it as one event. So back to verse 14. This is the final Passover, folks. When the hour had come. When the hour had come. What's the hour? Passover starts at sunset. That was the hour. Fascinating again. And the apostles with him. So Jesus takes the ten and meets up with the two that he'd sent ahead. John and Peter. Go prepare them. Jesus comes with the ten and they're going to have Passover together. Now I'm not going to give you a two hour dissertation on Passover and all the symbolism of it. It's a wonderful thing if you take a look at it. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I'll never eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it amongst yourself. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Reiterating, it's coming. That millennial reign is coming. It's coming. So it starts with a prayer of thanksgiving. This is the Passover. They have uh, four cups of wine. By the way, it's doubly diluted for Passover. First cup is called the cup of blessing. It speaks of the blessings of God. Then they wash their hands. They have a ceremonial hand washing signifying that their hearts are right before God. And not every time we have communion, but many times uh, I'll say to you, don't you take communion unless you know your heart's right before God and each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what they had with this washing of hands. And then they had the eating of the bitter herbs. And many of my friends say, Bruce, it's not herbs, it's herbs. <laughs> well, maybe it's herbs, but I usually say herbs. <laughs> And that symbolizes the bitterness of the slavery in Egypt before they were set free. Then they sing part of the Hallel. And I know James has talked about this. We've talked about it in the past. Psalm 113 right through to 118 is the Hallel. And they sing the first two chapters next. And what happens then is the head of the table explains why they're doing this. And I was checking out the, the Chosen again a couple nights ago, and Mary Magdalene, after her demons had been cast out, and she met Jesus for the first time, and, and uh, she held Passover. And she was so excited because she'd never hosted Passover. And so Jesus comes to the door, and, and, and she welcomes him in eventually. And uh, they sit for Passover. She's really nervous. And she said, well, no. He, he said, well, let's get started. She said, oh, no, no, you're here. You, you, should, you should tell the story. And and he looked at her and he said, no, no, Mary, I want you to tell the story. And that was a great thing. But usually it's the father. It's usually the head of the table, whoever's, whoever's there. It doesn't have to be that way. But that's what they do. They explain what it's all about. And then they eat the meal. And what's the meal? It's lamb. It's lamb. It's lamb combined with unleavened bread. Matzah. That's what they combine it with that's the main meal and it takes a long time after the meal they'll eat a they'll eat they'll drink a third cup of diluted wine and then they sing or say most most of the guys i remember talk about singing the halal and that would be 115 to 118 of psalms and then they have a fourth cup 
of wine. That's the Passover meal. And it takes a long time to get through it. So they ate the Passover. So what was going on during Passover that day? Well, the disciples were listening to Jesus. Jesus was talking to them. Probably preaching at them a bit. They acted out some stuff because we know they were, they were upset about who's the greatest and who's not the greatest and all that stuff. So there was a d- good discussion going on during that Passover. They sang, we know that. Peter was confronted. Ju- Judas was confronted and dismissed. And then Jesus gave them some warnings. So there was activity during this night. Verse 15, you remember that? He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. And I think we mentioned that a bit last week. This shouldn't have been new to the disciples. Several times. Son of man's got to suffer. He's got to die. But he will be raised again after the third day. Jesus knows everything. He, 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 he knows inductive Bible study. What's that? Who, what, where, why, when, and how. He knows it all. He knows it. Exactly. The rest is going to come. That mock trial is coming. He's going to be put on the cross. He's going to die before sundown. He'll be in the grave. And all that stuff happens in about a day and a half. And it boggles my mind, as I mentioned to you last week, and I, I just I shudder when I think this. He knew all of this stuff was going to happen to him before the world was even formed. He knew what was going to happen at least 4,000 years later. The suffering, the anticipation of the suffering. And he knew it. And he was fully man. He was fully human. No wonder he said to the Father, Father, if there's any other way, any other way, is there any other way? Please let this cup pass from me. And you know how precious the next words are. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The emotion there, well, the the author tells us. He was was sweating droplets like blood. The intensity. Verse 16 says this, For I say to you, I'll never again eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is his last meal before the cross. His last meal before the cross is this meal that he has here. So he eats the lamb and then he becomes the lamb. Did you catch that? He eats the lamb and he becomes the lamb. Verse 17 and 18. When he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it amongst yourself. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. That'll be the millennial kingdom. We've talked about that. The kingdom of God, when he comes back, sets his feet on the earth, and we enter into the kingdom reign of Christ. He doesn't point back to the Exodus. And that that, uh, reestablishing of that Passover meal in the millennium is not going to look back to to Exodus. It's going to look back to the cross. The cross. It's going to point to the cross of Jesus Christ. Ezekiel 45, 21, Luke 22, 28 to 30. The Passover, folks, was completed. It was fulfilled at the death of Jesus Christ. And it becomes a memorial. And then it's replaced. This is replacement theology. This is not Romans 11 replacement theology of uh, church uh, for over Israel. The Lord's table replaces the Passover. True replacement theology. But I find it wonderful because here he is talking about him coming back again. He's talking about the millennium. He's going to die next tomorrow, the next day. And he's talking about I'm coming back again, guys. Now we'll, we'll, we'll eat it again. We'll, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. He sees his suffering, but he also sees his coming glory. And you know, when we've talked about the millennium, and I love talking about it with folks that don't believe in it, that all millennial theory, but when you talk about the millennium, one of the reasons there has to be a millennium, there has to be a, a millennium here on this very earth. There has to be. Why? 
We have eight or nine reasons, but the one reason that I just love is the full manifestation of his glory. The whole world will see the full manifestation of the glory of Jesus Christ. Has never happened. Has never happened. We get glimpses, but it'll happen. His glory fully manifested on this earth. And I don't hear an amen here, but I don't. It's got to be one of the greatest times ever in our lifetime, even if it were only in our glorified bodies. I'm looking forward to that glorified body, by the way. Coming back to establish my kingdom. Okay, so that's the Passover. Let's go to the communion. Verse 19 says this. And when he'd taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body. You got this memorized? This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. After they had eaten, saying, The cup, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Memorize that if you don't memorize anything else. Get your marker out. Underline that if you don't underline anything else. Ah, oh, Wally, you did a good job emphasizing that. That's good. Wow, you're amazing, Wally. That is fantastic. What happened here? What was this all about? The transition here. What's going on? It's hard for a guy like me, pretty, pretty matter-of-fact, low-level guy, to explain what has happened here. This is a monumental transition in history right before us. Why? What do you say that for? Because it ends something. What does it end? Now get this. It ends Passover. It ends that ceremonial law that we, we speak about and 6,000 different laws they've added to the Ten Commandments. It ends that stuff. It ends the dietary laws. It ends the Sabbath laws. Some Christians aren't going to like it when I say this, but it ends the Sabbath. Because immediately they now serve and they worship when? Not on the Sabbath. On the first day of the week. It ends all those rituals. It ends the altars. It ends the priests. They don't need a priest. Why don't you need a priest? Because Jesus, go to Hebrews. Jesus is our high priest. When you're a believer now, you don't have to go through the Levitical priests. As a matter of fact, they get judged and they won't even be in the millennium, but we won't get into that. The sons of Zadok are the priests. Okay, Bruce, stop that. Jesus is our high priest. You and I as believers have direct access to the throne of God. There's no need for a holy of holies anymore. Now you're tramping on toes, Bruce. No, there's no need for it. The throne room. Jesus is my advocate. And I hope he's your advocate too. Coming back to establish my kingdom. Mm. I wrote a note in my Bible to myself. Wow. It's all gone. All that stuff's gone. It's all gone. He dies, he rises, they meet on Sunday. And guess who's the priest then? He's the priest. But we are part of the priesthood. Amen. Do you feel like a priest? Do you act like a priest? Are you acting holy before God? I know I mess up. But you know what's really neat? Isaiah tells me, you mess up, that's fine, Bruce. Actually, it doesn't say Bruce in this, but because I've wrapped you. I've clothed you in the garments of salvation, and I've wrapped you in the robes of righteousness. So when God the Father looks at me, he sees his son's righteousness. And that's why Jesus says, I've got you. You're mine. Nobody's going to take you away. You're in the palm of my hands forever, Bruce. You screw up, yeah, you'll have some consequences, but you're mine forever. Isn't that a precious thought? Especially in days like this. Verse 19 says, When he'd taken the bread and given thanks. So this would have happened after they sang Hallel. But you notice it's no longer the bread of affliction which the matzah was. What is it now? It's the bread. This is my body which I've given for you. There's the substitute, folks. He's the substitute. My body's the substitute. No more matzah. No more matzah. 
Take, eat. Why is it to be done? In remembrance of me. And I've told you this before. My thinking there is, why did he say that? Do this, Bruce, to remember me. Remember what I've done for you. Because of man, our weakness, I believe if he didn't say that, we'd forget. We would. That's my opinion. I know what my heart says. I know how I forget things. And he says, no, no, do it regularly so you remember me. You remember me. This is a new memorial, folks. It's now the bread and the cup given for you, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's the only sacrifice that satisfies God the Father. Isaiah 53, 3 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes, we're healed. That verse 20 is likely the last cup in the Passover after eating the meal. And so I would say to you that th this new covenant in his blood, this cup, it's everything. And even the, the Jews, even the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew. They knew what was coming. They knew that every covenant had to be sealed in blood. That's how it worked. You go back to when Abraham met God and, and did that, that uh, covenant. We could spend all morning on that one. Blood everywhere. They were sacrificing this and sacrificing that. So what is the new covenant? What's this big deal about a new covenant, Bruce? Well, did the, did the Jews know about a new covenant? Yes. Yes. They did. Ezekiel 36. My favorite is, is uh, Jeremiah 31. This is the only saving covenant. There are still covenants that haven't been fulfilled. The Abrahamic covenant hasn't completely been fulfilled yet that God made with Abraham in that case. But that, it's not a saving covenant. This is a saving, the only saving covenant. This is a, a covenant of forgiveness. This is a covenant of, of salvation, we call it. God forgives sinners, and it's ratified by the death of Jesus Christ. You know, before Christ died, God forgave sinners. After Christ died, where we sit, God forgave sinners and forgives sinners. But God forgives all sinners because Jesus died. Before and after. But it's only because he died. So he ratified the covenant, even though it was in effect before his death. It's in effect after his death. And he ratified it with his blood. It had already been applied before it ever happened. We know that. You go to Revelation chapter 5, it says he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, of the world. And I would just submit to you folks, if you don't haven't heard me already today, the new covenant is the only covenant that can save you. And so while we're praying for Israel, while we're praying for the whole situation over there, be remembering, be reminding yourself to pray for their salvation. They're lost without Jesus. They're lost. They have no hope. Nobody has hope without Jesus Christ and the salvation that he offers you. Give me a minute. Let's, let's go over to Jeremiah. I love this verse. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31. We'll close with this. Verse 31. That's easy to remember. Jeremiah 31, 31. And the Lord's talking to Jeremiah. Behold, days are coming, the Lord says, he declares, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. That's the Mosaic covenant. In the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. There's a whole sermon. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be 
my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and his man and each man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they'll all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord, for I will, listen to this now, forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. That's the new covenant. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. Does it happen for Israel? And if you're with us through the prophecies, prophecy series, mini series, you know Israel has completely rejected Jesus Christ. We find that in Matthew 23. And Jesus rejected them. Does that mean they're non existent? The church took their place? No. I'll go to chapter 11 of Romans. Romans and Paul says, not a chance. But as a nation, they've rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. But God has promised in several passages the nation Israel will survive and go into the millennial reign of Christ. In Zechariah chapter 13, most people don't study Zechariah. Once you get into it, you just don't want to put it down. Very, very key in Bible prophecy. And we found out and find out that in, Ze in Zechariah's account, at the end of the tribulation period, as Jesus is coming back with his church, all of the Jews that have survived during that tribulation period, one-third of them, one-third, will turn to Jesus as their Messiah. And still two-thirds will reject him. One-third will. And that'll be the third that makes up the nation Israel as they enter into the millennial reign of Christ, and they will form the nation Israel during that thousand-year period. And if you're a believer, you're not part of that deal because you're, if you're a believer, you're going to be taken in the rapture before the tribulation, but you get to see the show because you get to come back with Jesus at the end of the tribulation, and you will enter in as in your glorified bodies, not your, what do we call these, earthly bodies, almost said a bad word not in your earthly bodies you'll be in your glorified body and you'll be with Jesus and these disciples these 12 get promised later on in this chapter that they're going to be leading the tribes of Israel the 12 of them I think Paul's probably the 12th of them we'll see they'll be leading those tribes in the millennial reign can I have one more minute Zechariah 13 Zechariah 13. I won't read the whole chapter. <sighs> okay, I'll go down to verse 8. It'll come about uh, in all lines. Talking about the, uh, the, the tribulation period. Declares the Lord. I can go to Amos here. You can go to Ezekiel here. That two-thirds of it will be cut off and perish. But the third will be left in it. And I'll bring the third part through the fire. When he comes back, there's going to be a lot of fire. Refine them, I'll refine them as silver is refined. I'll test them as gold is tested. They'll call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, they're my people. And they'll say, the Lord is my God. And what a day that'll be for the Jewish nation. What a day that'll be for the world and for you and I as we watch Bible prophecy play out. This book, the truth, the truth. We don't see a lot of truth in our world today. You can count on this. This is the truth of God. You may not like what it says, but it's God's word. Let's live by it. And I mean, if we know the truth, then how should we live? How should we live? How should we live? No more Passover, folks. No more Passover. Lord's table. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the folks here that want to learn the truth. And Jesus, thank you for enduring the cross on my behalf, on the world's behalf. Thank you for saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And from the bottom of our hearts, 
We want to worship you. And we thank you for your sake. Amen.